Um, welcome everyone to tonight's webinar with the very lovely Julia Deville. We're very excited to have you, Julia, as part of this conversation. Um, and we're very glad, though, you know, that you've been able to stay in Australia, but um, because the borders have been closed with New Zealand, so we're glad that you've been able to hear and join us tonight. Um, my name's Melinda Martin. I'm the Gallery Director here at Linden. I hope you've all had a good week. And for some of us, we have a number of people joining us from overseas. Welcome. Um, thank you for getting up early in the morning or um, joining us a little later at night. I hope you've had a good week. And this is an opportunity to kind of ease into the weekend after a busy week. So I, I suspect there's some people joining us with a glass of wine in hand. Welcome. Um, and if you're not and you need to go and get yourself a cup now or a glass of wine, please do so. I'd like to welcome you to this special event, a 360 guided, guided tour of Julia Deville's Wholeness and the Implicit Order, which was relaunched our gallery in 2018 following a major renovation. The image that you see on the screen at the moment was from the opening weekend. Very fortuitously at the time, we captured um, an image, a photogrammetry image of um, Julia's exhibition. So we have a virtual version of that show that Julia is going to guide us through tonight. We also have a PowerPoint that um, Julia will talk through some of the images that you can see the work in a little bit more detail. But before we begin, there's a few little Zoom protocols. Um, this is a webinar, so you won't be able to see each other. You all remain mute throughout the presentation. Um, if you ask a question, you just need to type it in the Q&A section and we'll go through that. Um, Juliet and I, our Linden curator, will walk through those questions and be able to read them out to Juliet as we go through. So please feel free to type in your questions at any time. You can also add comments in the chat and I'm very glad to see that Simon James is drinking a gin and tonic as we speak. Um, we'll also post some links in there as we go along as Julia talks about a few things um, and we'll pop in with any other um, issues and Jasmine who is the Linda New Art image that you can see on the screen will monitor the chat and she'll respond to any questions or queries in there and take them off into the Q&A. This presentation will be recorded and will be made accessible after tonight through the Linden website um, and through Julia's website. We'll use um, closed captioning to do that so those of us in our community who would like to be able to read or have difficulty um, will be able to see it there. So let me begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which our gallery normally meets, which is the Boomerang of the Kulin Nation. We pay respects to their elders, both past, present and emerging, and we acknowledge their continuing relationship with the land on which we meet. We particularly welcome any First Nations people who are with us tonight. Let me introduce you to Julia Deville. Arriving in Australia from New Zealand on the cusp of adulthood, Julia trained as a jeweller before her long hunt for a taxidermy mentorship was successful. Driven by a strong commitment to animal rights, her sculptural assemblages stand as a form of gentle protest. Julia's work combines taxidermy animals with precious metals and gems, as well as unique ready-mades. Challenging our disregard for and, both, and consumption of both wild and domesticated animals, Wholeness in the Implicit Order um, expanded her practice into the field of holography and virtual reality. Julia's work is in the collections of the National Gallery of Victoria, the Art Gallery of South Australia, and the Museum of Old and New Art in Hobart, to name but a few. She's shown her artwork across Australia and internationally for almost two decades. In dialogue with her practice, Julia also designs and makes jewellery, focusing on bespoke wedding and engagement rings, which she and her team sells from, from her um, East Melbourne showroom by appointment. I'm now going to pass over to Julia, who will take us through the 360 degree um, tour. So just give us a moment as we share screens. Um, and I just also need to mention that Julia's internet has dropped up dropped out a couple of times when we um, were testing this. So if that happens, don't worry, she'll log out and log back in and we will uh, tap dance between the space if that happens. So let me just share our screen. So Julia, you should be able now to share your screen. All right. 
can you see that? Yes, we can. Hi, everyone. So this is um, the entry to my exhibition, Wholeness in the Implicit Order. And this piece is called Something Wicked This Way Comes. It's a taxidermy adolescent zebra. Um, I'll get in a little bit closer, but in the PowerPoint afterwards, we've got some detail shots where you can see it a little bit better. But um, the harness is made of sterling silver and set with black diamonds, and the reins are antique pearls. Um, there are also some other little details on it, like the, you can kind of see there, the Deville signature on the bum. Um, this is the first artwork I ever signed. Um, turning around, this kind of gives you a full view of the bedroom. This is my imagined bedroom. Um, as a child, I was a somewhat unusual kid, and so this is kind of like my dream bedroom as a child. So we've got a cot here with a taxidermy fawn, um, my dark heart mobile, which is freeze dried hearts and a taxidermy starling and some oak branches. Um, I've got a couple of smaller works to the right here. Oh, sorry, that's taking me down onto the ground. So there's my white walker cat rug. Um, and a rocking cat. I'm just gonna see if I can get up to the rabbit. So this piece is called Snow. It's a little white bunny with a Victorian carriage. And then the view of the fireplace. So the cat on the mantle is called Purring Cars and Pouring Rain, which is a lyric from a Nick Cave song. Um, and again, another little Victorian carriage. Um, another rocking cat down on the bottom left, and then a couple of smaller wrap pieces up on either side. Um, there was also a soundtrack which I decided not to play because it was a bit loud, but I have, um, it was like music box music of some influential bands from my youth, like the Smashing Pumpkins and Nirvana and that sort of thing, um, which I can send out a link for a Spotify playlist to that. Um, this set of drawers here, we've got a... Uh, Lion cub rug and then a little lion cub on wheels and then in the top drawer is a piece called interference pattern which is a pair of um, knickers carved from marble which I commissioned uh, New Zealand artist Joe Sheehan to do and then in the gusset you've got um, three lines of rubies set into it which is representing an interference pattern which um, the whole exhibition is kind of based on holography and the double slit experiment in quantum physics and this is a piece that kind of ties a lot of that together as well as my youth. Um, in the bottom drawer is a piece called Venerium Vitae which is like a basically a sexual CV. It's little pairs of white knickers with um, every relationship or sexual encounter written in the gusset and red glitter. Um, I think we might have a shot of that in the PowerPoint as well. Um, this piece here is a coffin suspended from the ceiling um, and then the raven flying over it. That's one work together. It's called Ostara and Damocles. Ostara is actually a porcelain doll that I made when I was 12 in a doll making course and then I remodeled her for this piece. Um, she's kind of in a crucifixion position and it's speaking about the origins of Easter, like the pagan or origins, Ostara, and then the Christian version, obviously. And so she's got um, ruby stigmata on her hands. She's got bunny ears to represent 
the kind of hallmark holiday, but also the pagan origins. And she has a crucifix around her neck. And then Damocles is kind of based on the sword of Damocles, which is the idea that you can't live, you can't enjoy life if you're living in fear. Um, fly through there. This piece is called In the Night I Wake and Feel Like I'm Dying. Um, this exhibition was probably the most challenging thing I've ever done in my life. And it got to the point where my health was starting to fail quite severely as a result of the stress and the amount of work I was putting into it. And I was actually waking up in the night with um, my arms and legs going numb. And so this piece is kind of speaking about that, apart, um, apart from the fact that it's a cute little lion cub. Um, he's got rubies set into his paws and a bow on his neck and he's sitting on a little pink cushion. Um, next to him is a rocking fox. His name is the folly of the second law of thermodynamics. Um, he's got a little saddle made from glow mesh and his harness is gold with diamonds set into it and then his reins are diamond beads. We have some blasphemous art here with a crucified parrot. Um, and then this is actually my dressing table from when I was a teenager. It's got written on the mirror, karma, penance and prostitution, which is what I actually had written on my mirror when I was a teenager. I can't remember where that came from, but I think I thought I was being pretty clever. Um, and that is the bedroom. Oh, and also the chandeliers are by my friend Adam Wildcabbage, who's a Philadelphian artist, and I commissioned him to make those for this show. So walking through now to the dining room. So we have Beatrix here, which is a piece that I just recently sent over to Dita Von Teese in LA. And yeah, she was, it was featured um, on an architectural site, which was quite cool. Um, he's a little bunny with a tuxedo jacket on, which was actually made for him by Bespoke Tailors. And it cost more and took longer than making a men's dinner jacket for a wedding. I think we had about 20 fittings all up. And um, I phoned about four different tailors to see if they would make it. And the ones that did it were the only ones that didn't hang up on me. So, um, yeah, I think they thought it was a prank call. <laughs> um, we've got just a raven flying here. And then over this side, a sterling silver raven skeleton. So this was made by making a mold of every single bone in the skeleton and then casting it into silver and then re-articulating it. Um, another raven, obviously quite like ravens. Um, this piece here is an adolescent deer, which they call spikies, and he's got a carving set with rubies encrusted on it and a cloche handle on his back. Um, coming round, there's a fox rug under the table. His name I have forgotten. Um, and then I've got the dining table here. So this is kind of, there's a taxidermy lamb with a ruby wound in her neck and she's got pearl rosary all down her back. Um, we have in the middle there, it's a silver dish full of finches with black diamond eyes. Um, there's a little plate that has a finch on it. Can't quite see it here. Um, Adam Waller Cabbage Candelabra, which is now sitting in my mum's house. I'm a bit jealous of that. Um, a little rabbit where, again, I've made molds and cast the rib cage and then reinserted it back in. It's kind of a juxtaposition of the softness, but also the hardness that is inside an animal like that. Um, 
we've got Lordosis, which is a, a rat in a dessert spoon with a pearl tail. And then Cornflower, which is a little puppy with sparrow wings on a cornflower plate. Um, this is one of my favourite works. It's a, this wasn't even a still one. I think this calf was actually taken out of a cow's stomach in a slaughterhouse. So it was in utero, it was very small. Um, and its headpiece is made of diamond beads. And again, you can't really see, but he's covered in black diamonds and black sapphires on the black parts of his body. Um, Sarah Chandelier. Yeah, there's just a chandelier that was lent to me by the Johnston Collection. It's beautiful. Um, over here, we have, you can't really see it, but it's a painting on black velvet by my friend Leslie Rice. Um, doesn't photograph particularly well. And then just a little rat on a plate down there. Um, coming into this dark room, this is one of the hologram rooms, which again, you can't capture with photogrammetry. So we will kind of skip through there. Um, and then this is my favorite thing I've ever made. This piece is called Mother is My Monarch and it was a dedication to my mum. It's a baby zebra, which um, has kind of, this work has been in the process for over 10 years. I first found out about him um, when the guy to taxidermy within Tasmania said it was in the freezer there and it had been there for over 30 years. And so I started harassing the museum to sell it to me, which they didn't want to do. And after about three years, they agreed. Um, he was quite badly, oh, not deteriorated, but because he'd been in the freezer so long, the fur wasn't in great condition. So I couldn't traditionally taxidermy him. So he's been freeze dried. Um, which somewhat dictated the pose. I couldn't do it standing up, but I'm really happy with this elongated sleeping slash dying pose. Um, his harness is made of sterling silver and black rhodium, and it's set with over a thousand rose cut diamonds. And again, the reins are antique pearls. The case was, um, I commissioned Kate Road to build for me. This is, um, before it was actually completely finished. It's had more added to it since the exhibition. And this work sold to a collector in New Zealand. So I'm very happy that this piece is going back to the motherland. Um, walk around the back here. So again, it's got the kind of signature cloche handle on the back and Adam Waller Cabbage Pink Chandelier, which is now in my showroom in East Melbourne. Um, and then come through to the last hologram room. Again, very difficult to see them, but some of these have rendered. So that's um, a hologram of my rocking alpaca from a previous exhibition. Um, again, another hologram of the same piece in a, a Cape Road frame and a series of little self-lit holograms, but I don't think, yeah, you can kind of make out some of them, but nothing too well. And then this is a hologram of a rabbit. This is a proper laser um, created hologram, but again, you can't see it all that well. So yeah, that's the, the four rooms of wholeness and the implicit order and I will take it back to you, Melinda. Great, thank you. So I'm just gonna go back in and share my screen. I will be one second while that happens. It just takes a little moment. And there we are back at the start. So Julia, here we are. Can you see that? Can everyone see that screen or not? No. Okay, let me go one more time because every now and then this is what happens in the world of working in this brave new world of virtual 
world. It was so fantastic to um to see your show again, Julia. This was just it was such a joy and just an outstanding experience, I think, for everyone that was involved. And I loved working on this exhibition with you. Um, but I do know that it was, um, I mean, it was so ambitious. There were so many parts to it. Um, I'm wondering if you um, might like to share some of the, the bits of it that were quite challenging. Um, yeah, what, what were some of the challenges in bringing that show together? Um, well, I guess I was already quite burnt out from years of previous exhibitions, but this show had been in the progress for such a long time that I just felt like I had to do it. Um, so it was, yeah, I pushed myself to get that work done and on top of, yeah, experiencing burnout, it was just, um, it was probably about six months of solid work and extremely stressful, but it was, yeah, I'm glad that I did it because it is the best work I've ever done, but I'm now taking a very extended break from making artwork as a result. Yes, I see. I remember as um, talking shortly after the show had gone up and you were saying that you were um, thinking of taking a break from making the taxidermy works um, and that you were happy to be moving into the, the kind of the new aspect to your practice, the holography that you were working on. Um, have you, since then, and it was the end of 2018, um, have you been making any work? No, so I'm not doing any, like the holography was fun to experiment with, but I don't really think it's for me. In my head, I thought it was going to be less challenging than the taxidermy because the taxidermy is fragile. You've got to worry about bugs. It's hard to transport. And the idea of making something flat that could just be hung on a wall seemed kind of smart, but actually it's way more involved. You need a huge studio, you need a um, giant like laser. It's a lot of work. And yeah, so I'm just focusing on the jewelry at the moment. I'm just really working on doing wedding and engagement rings and that sort of thing, which I get a lot out of and it doesn't, it doesn't, drain me it actually feeds me mm. um, as well as um, there being a lot of uh, different physical aspects to this exhibition it was just so thematically and conceptually rich as well um, and I think a lot of the themes that were in this exhibition are uh, still very relevant if not more relevant today um, than at that time um, the ideas around, um, you know, that, that humans are not separate to nature and we're all part of a, a continuum and we're all bound together with, with nature and with animals. Um, and I know you talked a lot about um, the preciousness of life and um, the close connection between life and death. And I, we loved thinking about these things and we had a lot of events and a lot of talk around these themes. Are there still themes that you think about, um, even when you're, you know, making your jewellery? And yeah, can you would... maybe reflect on some of that thematic content? Yeah, I think themes of life and death and nature have been present in my life since I was a child. I think that's why I make the work that I make. And now that I'm living up the coast um, in nature, I guess it's even more apparent now, like I'm spending a lot more time in forests and at the beach and I feel more connected to nature than I have in my life, which I guess is another reason I don't feel so, the desire so much to be making the work because I feel like I'm kind of getting that from from somewhere else. But yeah, especially in these times, there's, there's a big disconnect in a way because we're all spending so much time on computers and interacting in that way but then it also gives you the freedom to be able to spend time in nature as well and, and yeah have some more freedom mm. well as i mentioned it was it was amazing to have that tour around the exhibition mel are there any questions coming in um for julia about the show that we saw we do we've got quite a few questions would okay. you like me to just go through them now julia yeah i'm happy to yeah. do yeah so Maria has asked, um, 
with the individual works that you create, do you kind of pre-envisage them, sketch them, or you just do you work in the moment? It really depends on the piece. So, um, like, if I speak about, I'll speak about a couple of things that give different examples. Mm -hmm. The giraffe was, I was constrained by the fact that I had to freeze dry. So the pose was restricted to the size of the freeze dryer. So that's how I came up with that pose. So I actually posed him before coming up with anything else. I just had the giraffe sitting in my studio in a big, um, in a giant wooden box. And then when I went to work on him, I realized it needed a case. And because it was such a special piece, I didn't want just like a kind of museum style case. I wanted something that really, uh, spoke to how important this work was so that's why I got Kate Road to to build the case for me and we you know I kind of I designed it based on her existing works and um, from there the decorations I have kind of signature things that I do like I really enjoy using the harnesses and reins and stuff to, it's kind of a comment on the way that we try to harness nature and the commoditization of animals um, and then there's also you know speaking about the fact that we eat them and that's why I use the cloche handles on the back to kind of bring that element into them so I just start playing with a piece and start creating things and as I go the ideas come and they change but yeah it's a very free form process as much as it can be when you know certain elements need to be planned out just to be able to work but yeah it kind of feeds into each other and I just keep playing with it until it gets to a point where it feels finished and the giraffe I really was working on for gosh probably a year for the decoration process um, playing around with different ideas and building up things to use and you know I've got a whole drawer of stuff that was made for the giraffe that hasn't actually been applied to him um, then there are other works I'm just trying to think of if there's one in the show that speaks to this but yeah there have been pieces before like for example I did a calf that's now in the NGV's collection he's hanging from the ceiling by one foot like a calf would be or like a cow would be in a slaughterhouse and his neck has been or her neck has been slit and has um, pearls pouring out of it and that was kind of a comment on the dairy industry and the fact that they take the bobby calves away from the mothers at a few days of age and that they're considered a waste product. So they're slaughtered and used for dog food and other things. Um, so I had that concept and actually needed to find a calf to do that, which was difficult when you only work on things that have died of natural causes. So it took me a year or so to find a calf that had died of natural causes and then built the piece but there was still a free form aspect to it like as I do it I kind of freestyle with how the decoration works but that was probably my most planned out work most things would be more like the giraffe where I have an animal I kind of pose it and just with what feels right and then I start decorating it and I go until it feels finished Thank you, Julia. That's fabulous. I now like to pop across to Jan um, Janice, who has asked, "Why do you believe taxidermied animals have such power to move people?" In the context of your work, um, oh, look, I think it's the face, really. The you know, if you think about it, we're all desensitized to the animals in our lives, like the leather that we wear and the food that we eat and that sort of thing, it's all faceless and it's much easier to consume when you're not faced with a face. And I think the taxidermy people find it so confronting because you can't ignore the fact that it was an animal or it is an animal and its life is gone. Um, the eyes are particularly important. I find whenever I've done taxidermy pieces with closed eyes, they very rarely can you carry the same power um there's yeah there's something even though the eyes are glass they're not obviously the original eyes because they can't be preserved 
there's something about eyes, I think, you know, that whole idea of the window to the soul and um, it's, yeah, it, I, I'm just trying to think of how to word it, but there's something about capturing an animal in a moment that I think is quite powerful. And if you can express the fragility and the beauty of the life of that animal, and for me, it's a celebration of that life. Um, you then, yeah, that's when it, I find it moves people in positive and negative ways. You know, I have people crying at my exhibitions. I have people getting angry. I get death threats and hate mail. You know, I get the kind of full spectrum of human emotion. And although I don't really enjoy the death threats, um, as an artist, I do feel like if you're creating emotion, you are doing good work. Thanks, Julia. I think when, there's a really interesting question from Karen who's asked, um, so, you know, you sell some of these works, you store some of these works, um, but where do you store them if they don't sell? Like, what, what happens to them um, after an exhibition like this? I've got a storage unit full of plastic Tupperware containers. Um, all, like, all of the animals are, yeah in plastic Ziploc bags, within plastic Tupperware containers to protect them. Um, I have a lot of works, well, I, when I had a home, I had a lot of works in my home. All of my stuff is in storage in New Zealand at the moment. And then my parents both have quite big collections as well. You're lucky to have those collections. I, I think I should like move into your family. I think I, I could fit in quite nicely. Yeah. Um, Maria has also asked, what do you look for when you're choosing an animal for a piece? I don't choose animals. They come to me. So because I only work on animals that have died of natural causes, I rely on donations. Mm -hmm. um, I get a lot of just random strangers emailing me saying they found something. Um, obviously friends and family as well people donate their pets when they die and I have contacts with farmers who also give me stillborns and that sort of thing and also other taxidermists where I get some of the exotics from um, but I'm actually not taking donations at the moment because I my studio at the moment is only set up to do jewelry and I don't have a freezer anymore so I actually gave away I had a whole freezer full of stuff and I gave the freezer and all of the animals away to another taxidermist when I moved I just that's just such a funny conversation to have out loud I never thought I would hear I've, I've just moved my freezer full of animals to another taxidermist as a sentence but there you go um, Sue has also asked, where do you get your inspiration for, for making this type of work? Um, definitely nature. So, yeah, I would say my big, my biggest inspiration is just nature and then kind of getting more specific. Life and death has been something I've been interested in since I was a kid. And then I'm really inspired by, like, the Victorian era and more kind of you know, the memento more period of the 15th to 18th century, anything really pre-1900 aesthetically I'm interested in. Um, and, yeah, that's, that would be the basic thing. But I don't, yeah, I would say the, the ideas do just kind of come in a more natural way. Like it's not something I sit down and, like, think about it. They do just feel like they kind of, pop in from some ethereal place. And I think Victoria's asked a really interesting question because she's interested in how would you describe your work's response to the history of taxidermy animals in museums? Yeah, so I'm very fond of the tradition of taxidermy in museums. I feel like it is about, you know, celebrating the animal or more so than the trophy hunting industry does um, but for me I'm not that interested in like portraying the animal in its in its most realistic likeness and in its habitat like I'm interested in taking the animal to a different dimension and I think people are more likely to 
contemplate the ideas I'm speaking about when there is that juxtaposition and there is something unusual going on there. Whereas if you have, you know, like a zebra in the Sahara, it's like we've all seen that image before. Um, but when you have a zebra on a carousel pole with diamond reins, it kind of, you're forced to think about what's going on there and, and all of the ideas behind it. I think. And Alona has asked, um, how long did it take you to research and find all the elements for the show? I guess because your work is so layered, um, often you might have to find the right jewel or the right um, something else to, to make it. How long, do, how do you do that? Yeah, so the show, like I, like I, I was probably conceptually thinking about the show for least four or five years um, and it just got more and more refined but it just depends on the piece like I have a pretty big stock of stuff that I've just collected over the years anyway so I've got drawers of like old lace and different beads and different gems and I know where to source most things but you know when you're doing large scale it was actually difficult like the black diamonds that are in the zebra bridal um, to get the right sizes, I ended up having to order thousands of them because they'd come in and they'd be the wrong size and they wouldn't fit in the setting. And yeah, it's getting quantity of stuff like that is quite difficult because obviously in jewelry, you're using like maybe 12 little diamonds in a ring. Whereas in the zebra, I think we had over 500. Um, the pole for the zebra was very difficult. Like I actually had a few different people who tried to make it for me first and then I ended up getting it made in wood and casting it. And I had to like, the base was actually set the same piece as the cloche handle that's on the back of a lot of animals. So I had that 3D scanned, enlarged in CAD, 3D printed in plastic in several bits and then molds made of that. And that was cast into bronze along with the pole. Um, and obviously the pole had to be made to specific sizes to go through the zebra and have threads put into it. So it kind of looks like a simple piece, but that was probably one of the hardest things to do to get all of that stuff right. And um, then there's just a lot of really labor intensive stuff like the reins are pearls, but each pearl is hand linked together with white gold. So, you know, there's hours of labor, which me and my team do together to build all of these components and fitting the bridle as well was something that my senior jeweler and I spent months and months fiddling around with to get it right because the zebra is not symmetrical. You actually have to kind of adjust the sides and yeah, make some pieces smaller to make them work. And then they've got to be curved to fit the shape of the face. So yeah, there's a lot of kind of very fiddly stuff and some things that look like, you know, it might have just taken a, a few hours. Like we could have spent weeks working on. And I, I'm just going to ask a question that's about, um, because some people are sort of talking about it and I, in different ways. So one of the things I've always found most fascinating about the work that you do is that you're also, for you, this work is really about a protest and that you're, a, you know, I would say a dedicated vegan. And I'm just interested, because there's a few people asking questions about this, I'm just interested if you'd like to just share that kind of, how some people find that a really interesting tension in your work. Well, firstly, I'd say I'm not vegan anymore. Um, I was, I was a vegetarian, I became vegetarian when I was 12. And then I was a very strict vegetarian from my early 20s. Um, and then for the last probably six or so years I was vegan, but unfortunately I ended up having some quite serious health issues as a result of that. And idealistically, I really wanted that to be something that I could do to sustain, to sustain myself, but I have had to start introducing animal products into my diet again, which was a very challenging and confronting thing for me to do as an ethical vegan. Um, but yeah, it just got to the point where I had to do something about it and I had been told by many doctors and specialists similar information um, but I'm still very much a 
advocate for animal rights and that's why I only use animals that have died of natural causes in my work and the um, animal products that I do consume I'm very specific about where they are sourced and that sort of thing so I still you know I believe that we need to be very careful about the way we consume animals but yeah it was it's hard because you know my identity was quite tied up in this and being you know classed as the vegan taxidermist it's yeah it was something that probably took me a lot longer to make the changes um and I probably would have had less consequences as a result if I had done it sooner but yeah I was very attached to that and yeah it was tricky Juliet, do you want to ask a few more questions and I'll leave the, um, the Q&A for a bit and then pop back in in a little moment and go through the rest of the questions. Yeah, great. Um, I was wondering, Julia, um, one of the, the first room that um, we entered as part of your tour um, was the bedroom. And you said that that was, um, you know, inspired by your childhood or like a dream bedroom for you. I was wondering if you could recall the first time that you reflected your own life experiences in your work, because I know you started creating things when you were quite young. I was wondering if you could tell us more about some of those early works that you made. Um, well, the first time I think I actually reflected my life in my work was probably the Linden Show. Like That was the first time I really had a lot of personal stuff in there, and that again was quite confronting and you feel like you're putting yourself on display in a way. Um, but yeah, the thing that kind of comes to mind is like my first, what I, what I see as my first good idea was for my 18th birthday party. And then this was reflected in the show um, for my 18th birthday party, the invitations, I went to a whole lot of op shops and got little girls, white knickers and wrote the, directions for my party in red pen in the gusset and proceeded to hand them out to my friends and my mum was horrified which I think made me laugh <laughs> um, and so I think that's kind of where the idea for that venerium vitae work came from it was kind of like a an extension or a development of that and yeah I've always had a dark sense of humor and um that's what I was trying to bring to some of those elements of the bedroom. Mm. And I think I'm right in saying that actually the Linden space itself was, um, you know, influenced the way you thought about this exhibition quite a bit. Um, could you maybe tell us a bit more about how working in this very specific space was, it was a good match for your show and how it, how it impacted on your thinking about it? Yeah, well, I would say it's like, not so much that it influenced it was more just that it was the right space like I've never had the opportunity to exhibit somewhere that suits my work and I'm always trying to dress a gallery to make it look like London which you know you can't do with the budgets that you're working with you know like I would rather spend that money in making the work um, but yeah to be in a gallery like that that already is completely my style and beautiful like all we really did was put some chandeliers up and hang some curtains and do wallpaper in a room and it was done like it was just it, it didn't need anything done to it and it was so nice to be able to create that immersive space like when I had my show at the NGV and did an immersive dining room you know we had to put so much work into turning the NGV into a Victorian room and it cost a lot of money whereas this was yeah it was already there and it was a very beautiful experience perfect just it felt so right yeah. um i was wondering if you had any um could you say what your favorite parts of either the creative process generally or your favorite bits of bringing this show together what are the best bits my favorite part of the creative process is when i just get to make which you know, unfortunately, is a small part of doing, being an artist. Like, there's so much admin work, there's so much getting things organised. But, like, for me, the pure joy is when you are just, like, for me, working on the giraffe. Like, I would 
clear a day where I've got five or more hours and in that time you know I wouldn't eat I wouldn't leave the room I would just be playing my favorite music and gluing pearls into a giraffe's bum <laughs> <laughs> the perfect afternoon <laughs> do we have any more questions coming in Mel? yeah we do um Karina has asked that you have quite a few mice and rats that are beautifully featured in the exhibition. Is there any particular significance for that um, in your practice? Well, A, there's a lot of dead mice and rats around. People are pretty free with their killing of those sort of things and they also just like to die on their own. Um, but for me, I also quite, I like things like pigeons and rats and stuff because they're seen as disgusting. People, people, most people don't particularly like them. But when you curl up a little baby rat and give it some diamond eyes and put it on a plate or something, like they're just so beautiful. Like they're sweet and they're cute. And I think for me, I like showing people that side of things, you know, like we're, again, we're conditioned to think rats dirty and they're disgusting but they're actually like if you look at it objectively it's a beautiful creature and um i like i like taking the ordinary and elevating it to a different level um renee has asked when can we when could you expect to see your next jewelry exhibition um that will definitely be the next thing that comes it probably won't be this year um this year we're just, I'm kind of moving my focus into just doing rings. So we're working on setting up a, we're going to set up an online sale where I'm going to get rid of most of my silver stock um, and just make room to have, yeah, have a practice that's more focused around, you know, the really kind of precious rings made from gold and platinum and stones. And so I guess once that has happened and I've cleared all of that out, Probably next year we will do, um, maybe in the studio, maybe in the showroom, I mean, a, a show of rings. Like, I'd really like to do a really large exhibition of, you know, 30 or more precious rings and maybe a few earrings and necklaces. But yeah, that is what I love. Like, if I could do any creative thing right now, my favourite thing to do would just be sit down for a few hours and just make new rings and I've got a, a safe full of, gems that I've been saving to make some new pieces so yeah I'm waiting till, till I get set up in a new place and can spend some time focusing on that. Right. Um, Simon has asked have you are you inspired by the Victorian cabinet of curiosities? Yes the Bundakama. Mm -hmm. um, I'm I love I've always been a collector since I was a child. Like my dad used to take me to junk shops and so I learned very young to appreciate that sort of thing. And um, I think when I was like six or so, I found a seahorse skeleton on the beach and, you know, my collection has been growing ever since then. Dad has bought me some Netsuke and some, like, I've got some gloves from a 15th century suit of armour and... It's really, you know, normally my home is is a Wunderkammer and my showroom and studio is as well. Like, I just love surrounding myself in curios, like antique medical equipment, you know, Victorian syringes. I can, um, yeah, nautilus shells, all of that sort of thing. I just think it's so beautiful and I love pairing unusual objects together. Um. Someone, Janice, has asked what the symbolism of the cloche handles has for you. So a lot of my work is based around the way that we consume animals and a big part of that is the way that we eat animals. And I'm very opposed to factory farming and that sort of thing, you know, the, a lot of the cruel practices that happen in mass production of animal products. And so my first show about that was called Degustation and um, there were a lot of animals that were served on, you know, taxidermy animals on silver platters 
and that's when the cloche handle came in. So instead of actually having a cloche over the piece, the piece is like becoming part of the cloche. And yeah, the idea was really about like identifying with what we eat and be, having awareness around it instead of like buying meat that comes in a polystyrene package. It's like, again, it's faceless and anonymous and it's much easier to consume i feel like there needs to be an identification with it and an understanding of what you're participating in like my work has never been about trying to stop people eating meat or turning people vegan or vegetarian it's more about creating awareness so people would make the decisions that they would actually make when provided with all of the information like one thing that i talk about a lot and i've done a lot of work around this is like the egg industry where um you know there's a lot of stuff that kind of goes on there um and one piece i've done i'm just trying to think which what it was called uh albumin was um three chicks in a wine goblet and so you know most people these days buy free-range eggs but there's a lot of products like mayonnaise and wine and ice cream that use factory farmed eggs. So there are people who are buying products that they're not morally aligned with and they've just never thought about it before. So that's kind of what I'm trying to do is bring people to their understanding so they can make better choices. Thanks, Julia. Um, Juliet, do you want to ask a couple more questions? Sure. Um, I have so many questions. It's so it's just such fantastically rich work. Um, maybe one one thing I was interested in is um, your relationship to the to your work, and we sort of touched on the fact that some of it is autobiographical, um, and certainly it seems like some of the autobiographical information is quite personal. So I was interested to um, to know how comfortable you were with with that part of your work. And if you might go down that down that track again, um, I'm very uncomfortable with it, which is probably why I will go down that track again. Because I think <laughs> you, you get to a point where, like, every time I've done work that I think is really important, it's been when I've been scared to put it out there, and that was degustation. When before I did that, I was really worried. Like my work before had been quite subtle about my ideas around animal rights and then I did a very literal exhibition and yeah I was terrified because I was already getting hate mail and stuff before that um but yeah in terms of the autobiographical stuff that was very hard for me to put out there and I would say the most confronting part was when my mum came to the exhibition and started reading the knickers um, <laughs> And I was like, Mum, I don't think you should look at that. And she was like, what's this about heroin? And I was like, look at it, Mum. Like, it's like, I, that was the one thing, that was the thing that really held me back because I knew my mum was going to see the show and I didn't want her to see that bit, but I felt like it was a really important thing and it was quite a cathartic, like, it, even on a, in terms of personal development, I felt like I had to kind of go through that process to try and, like, heal some stuff and, um, face some things that had happened to me and that was my way of doing that but yeah there are certain things that your mum just doesn't need to know <laughs> and when she came actually I had some of the more kind of like confronting gusset dis descriptions to the bottom of the pile so she couldn't see them um Another question that I have, and I, I always like to ask artists this because they tend to leave, lead such interesting lives generally, um, but what's some of the best advice you've ever been given, either personally or professionally? Um, I would say, well, this is, I, I've, I can't remember who even gave me this advice, but just learning to say no. Um, when you're a young artist, your philosophy is yes, like you say yes to everything and you're grateful to get opportunities and you know that, you know, you don't know how long your career is going to last. But I think as, as your career progresses, it's impossible to say yes to everything. And I was still in that mentality for a long time where I was taking on too many things. And that was when my 
burnout first started because I had 10 exhibitions in a 12 month period. And, you know, one of those was at the NGV, one was at the AGSA, two solos at my galleries. Like it was just way too much. And by the end of it, I ended up in a not very good position emotionally and physically. And, um, yeah, I had to learn to say, to start saying no to things. And it's actually quite empowering when you learn to do that. And now my motto is no is the new black. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Um, do we have any more, Mel? Um, yeah, we do. And I think it's an interesting question about the taxidermy process, Julia. It's just, are there any health risks working with um, taxidermy animals or in that process of, taxidermy i would have said no until this linton show but i actually as well as the stress and stuff like i spoke about that piece in the night i wake and feel like i'm dying that was stress but there was i also got poisoned by the tanning solution that was used in the taxidermy so i when i do taxidermy myself i don't use a tanning solution i always just do it naturally so it's very clean i guess you could possibly catch disease off some animals but I've you know I've never had that experience I probably was a bit too um cavalier when I've done bats in the past I think now <laughs> <laughs> cautious um but yeah the I so the zebra was actually done by another taxidermist for me to my specifications and um a couple of other works I outsourced as well for the show and I was handling the works a huge amount as I was decorating them and obviously breathing it in. And after, by the time the show came around, like I feel like it's hard to know what, what was what, but I feel like it was a um, collabor collaboration between stress and metal poisoning and because there's aluminium in the tanning solution. And yeah, by the time the show came around, I couldn't wear any of my rings. My hands were so swollen and um yeah, i was having insomnia and all sorts of weird health stuff going on like heart palpitations and things and then at one point one of my assistants said to me oh do they use any chemicals in these and i was like oh god i hadn't even thought about that and spoke to the taxidermist and yeah found out that it was an aluminium based tanning solution and um yeah so more it's more the chemicals than anything and you know it's, the victorians used to use arsenic in their taxidermy so you want to be careful if you're buying some pre-1900 work which is why the term mad as a hatter comes stems from it's because people would wear mercury yeah, yeah and they would um that it would slowly send them um a little bit odd um, I've had got a couple of questions just about, I guess it's interesting, you've talked about like the challenges after this show, but do you think the themes of that kind of, you know, exhaustion and burnt out kind of feelings that you had will be things that you might explore in your work in the future? Yeah, definitely. Like, um, I feel like some of that was, the beginning of that was starting to happen in the bedroom at Linden. Um, but yeah, I, I, I feel like all of your life as an artist kind of gets distilled and how literal it is varies, but yeah, I'm sure that will be a part of future iterations. Which I think is um, one of the, it's always food for thought. There's always more chances to actually make new work, which I think is always interesting. Someone's asking very cheerfully, you have to tell us what the heroin message is in the, in the knickers, but I say don't go there. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was just um, a guy that I hooked up with when I was 16 and he was like one of the cool, like, you know, the archetypal cool person. <laughs> and I later found out that he was a heroin addict. So the, what the gusset said was, you were so fucking cool, shame about the heroine. <laughs> um, one other person's asked, I think, an interesting question, which I think is also about the taxidermy, is that do collectors, in terms of when they need to care for the work that they might buy from you, how do they have to look after it? 
Um, everything now comes in a glass case. Um, I just kind of do that because in the past I've told people that they need to get cases and they don't and then the work gets ravaged by bugs. But yeah, it's it's kind of essential. Like it, you can spray them, but it's not, you know, it's not ideal. Like the best thing to do is to is to just keep it protected in a case. Thanks, Juliet. Do you have any more questions? Well, I think we could probably talk all night, to be honest. Um, but I, I, I was planning on finishing on the, the one about the advice. I think that was very good advice. <laughs> mm. um, so there's been some really great questions. Julia, thank you for your time. It's so lovely to see you again and have another conversation with you. Um, it's always a delight. Each time I... Um, get to talk to you I always come away really inspired by um, listening to what you've been working on and what you've been doing um, I still remember being able to go um, to the studio in one of our first studio visits when I think I took Juliet and I remember talking to you and then all I saw was Juliet just just constantly looking around your studio completely um, betwixt and bemused by everything that was there as if it was if like I can't talk I've just got to look and and I know we've taken some collectors into your studio in the past as well and they have all just loved it so thank you very much Julia um, I've got to stop sharing the PowerPoint because it was flickering on some people's screens so I've taken that off and it's just us um, We've provided this as a free event. If you have enjoyed yourself and you'd like to support Lyndon, please feel free to make a donation to Lyndon. You can do it on our website. Um, we're also very delighted to let you know that we're able to open the gallery again. So the gallery will be open from Tuesday next week. Um, you can book in um, a session time online. And we've got three very beautiful exhibitions by Carla Dickens, Robert Fielding and Jackie Stockdale. So thank you, everyone. Good night, um, have a lovely weekend, and Julia, thank you very much again, and we'll see you all very soon in the gallery. Thanks, Julia. Bye.